With Pokemon exploding into popularity, wait, no, I already used that line. Oh well. Pokemon's immense success meant that other companies would inevitably want a slice of the pie. Two of those companies were Natsume Company, now known as Natsume Atari, and Imagineer. In June of 1997, a new manga series called Madarot began its serialization in the magazine Comic Bonbon. In the meantime, Natsume was, hopefully, hard at work on developing a game to go with it. Similar to Pokemon Red and Green, the game would be released in two versions, Kabuto and Kuagata. Because, of course it would. Five months later, in November of 1997, the first pair of games was released. The stars of the series are the Madorots, or Madabots as they would eventually be known outside Japan. They are small, sentient robots composed of six primary pieces. The first is the Timpet, which is basically the skeleton. There are both male and female Timpets, each with their own parts that are incompatible with the other sex. On the Timpets you attach the head, left arm, right arm and leg parts. The legs determine the Metabot's type of movement, while the head and arms are the weapons. Finally, there are the medals. These are basically the heart or brain of the Metabots. Each medal has its own skills and abilities, and some are more compatible with certain parts than others. It's also from these that the robots get their names. They are metal robots, hence Madorot and Madabot. I like the latter more since it makes it clear that they are robots rather than rotting metals or whatever. The backstory of the series is that a geologist discovered and excavated some strange hexagon-shaped metals. After years of researching and studying these metals, scientists were able to draw out their powers and created the Madabots, robots that use these metals as their brain. The Metabot company is then established and begins selling mass-produced, general-use versions to the public. They are hugely successful and Metabots become part of everyday life. A popular activity is robattling, in which teams of up to three Metabots fight each other. However, a group of jerks known as the Robo Robo Gang begin to use Metabots for their criminal activities. The game's story takes place in the near future. You play as Hikaru Agata, a young boy with little interest in Metabots or Robatwing. One day, while taking his dog for a walk, he finds a medal dropped by Robo Robo Wacky. In the Kabuto version, it's a Kabuto medal. In the Kuagata version, it's... well, I'm sure you can guess what it is. Being the good boy that he is, he decides to turn in the medal to the local authorities. But they let him keep the medal because... Uh, reasons. He goes back home and, wow, his dad gives him a tippet and some rare parts that conveniently are also highly compatible with his medal. Man, what are the chances? In the Kabuto version, you get the KBT parts set, forming Metal Beetle, better known as Metabi. In the Kuagato version, you get the KWG set, named Head Scissors, or commonly also known as Rokusho. This stayed as the series' tradition, and with every game you get new versions of these parts sets. Some are direct upgrades, some are variations, but either way, the starter Metabots throughout the series has always resembled the originals. Your next objective is attending class. It's the last day before summer vacation, and as homework, the teacher instructs the class to visit various locations around the city and explore and learn about them. It's here that the adventure truly starts. You wander around, robotting other people, solve problems, collect parts and medals, and hopefully have fun along the way. Being the first entry in the series, it's natural for it to be a bit rough around the edges. But this game is rougher than a chainsaw. The interface is kind of terrible. Not only is it kind of slow when interacting with things, opening the menus or scrolling through your parts, it's also not very helpful in battle. There's no way to check part stats and attributes during battles, which can be unnecessarily confusing at first. And there are a lot of stats and attributes. As for battles themselves, the potential for greatness is there. 
Instead of a standard turn-based combat system, the weapons have charge-up and cooldown times, so in theory you would have to consider balancing your setup with weapons that are fast but weak, weapons that are slow but strong, weapons that are inaccurate but powerful, weapons that fit in the middle ground between the rest, etc. In reality, some weapons are just straight up superior to others in every way. A large portion of weapons have low stats overall or are just way too specialized in a single stat to be worth using. There are melee weapons such as blades and claws that aren't particularly accurate but also have very low power. There are lasers that are very powerful but are too inaccurate to be reliable. Then there are a few weapons that have good stats all around and most importantly are capable of causing chain reactions. Most weapons only deal damage to a single part, but those capable of chain reactions start dealing damage to other parts if they destroy the first part they hit. Since most parts can be destroyed in one or two hits, chain reactions are extremely useful. It's not uncommon for this to destroy two parts with a single attack, so there's no real reason to use any other weapons. Another major problem is how targeting works. Melee weapons are simple. The enemy closest to the center is the target. With ranged weapons, it's a complete crapshoot. I'm sure that deep down there's some logic to it, but even after testing I still have no idea. Even against the exact same set of enemies, the target enemy changed between tests. To add to this, attacks target a specific part even though the game doesn't say which and there was a decent amount of times when one of my metabots cancelled its attack because the target part was already destroyed by another. I feel like this was done solely to stop the player from just targeting the enemy leader's head for a nearly instant victory, but it simply ends up increasing the luck factor in battles. Just as easily as you can instantly win a battle by getting lucky and hitting the leader's head, you can also lose instantly because your party's leader got its head blown off right away. This is... less than fun, to put it kindly. The battles aren't even fun to watch either, but there will be a lot of watching. They take way too long thanks to the slow animations and slow damage display. There's an option to make them faster, but they are still too slow. The metabots themselves also look kind of awful. The sprites are small and the proportions are horribly squished. The overworld graphics do look fine though, so at least there's that. The plot is all over the place. Although you have to travel to many different places, you have to do it in an arbitrary order. The real problem is that there are several times where you have to go to a specific area for no reason other than it no longer being blocked. Also for absolutely no reason. You just go to the next area because it's the one that's unlocked. This makes the game feel disconnected, like it's basically a collection of separate short stories, all lumped together without any regard for consistency. It does pick up near the end, though. There's a big competition, the Rubber Robo Gang is up to no good, and there's even a part where the Metabots start going bonkers. You might even call them... Metabots. There are occasionally things that you can miss because of how ridiculously obscure they are. The best example is this bizarre area which warns you that you don't have permission to enter and tells you to save the game. If you move to the top, most likely the game will reset. However, there's a small chance that it doesn't reset and you get one of four rare parts. It's literally just saves coming until you get them all. Why? Who thought that this was a good idea? The one undeniably good part of the game is the music. The battle theme must have been really popular because they remixed it and used it in various games throughout the series. The rest of the soundtrack is mostly just as good. If I really had to nitpick something, it's the battle preparation screen music, which is kind of lame compared to the track in the later games. The soundtrack was composed by Kinuyo Yamashita, who was also responsible for the music in the Telefang games, which I've previously covered, so maybe you'd like to check those out too. Wink wink nudge nudge. In 1998, Imagineer released Madrot Parts Collection 1 and 2. 
As the name implies, it's about collecting parts. And that's it really. It was meant to be two things. One of them is being a sandbox sort of game that allows you to easily collect every metal and part, which can then be traded into the original game. In fact, when you boot it up, it even says that this game is more of an add-on than anything else. The other is being a cynical cash grab. Almost everything in parts collection is straight up recycled from the main game. The pair of games follow Paddy and Yuki, two characters from the base game. In parts collection 1, Paddy dreams that she and Yuki are the princess and prince of the Metabot and Timpet kingdoms, and an evil witch kidnaps Yuki. In parts collection 2, Yuki develops a game where he and Paddy are the prince and princess of the Timpet and Metabot kingdoms, and an evil witch kidnaps Paddy. Wow, they thought of the same thing. What are the chances? And wow, in both games you need to climb the same towers, fight the same people and get the same medals and parts. Coincidences are beautiful. Is this the power of love? They don't fix any of the problems with the original game. They weren't very well received either, which is understandable considering how obvious the lack of effort put into them is. Imagineer later did the same thing with Metarot 2 and 3, but stopped after that. In 1999, Medorot Perfect Edition was released for the Wonderswan, again in Kabuto and Kuagato versions. It was developed by Tose, an interesting company that has probably developed at least one game you've played, even if you weren't aware of it. Perfect Edition is an updated version that addresses some of the problems with the original game. The interface is a lot better, it's cleaner, more detailed and thankfully much faster. The metabots have more realistic proportions and look really nice. There's also more dialogue, which helps give characters some personality. Your starter metabot actually speaks this time around. On the other hand, the gameplay balance is still awful. The overworld graphics are mostly the same as the Game Boy version. The biggest downside is that the music took a bit of a downgrade. Most tracks are fine, but unfortunately the battle theme got the short end of the stick. Still, if you're interested in checking out the first game in the series, this is the version to go for. Then there's... this. Shingata Medorot, or Real Type Medobots, is a complete remake of the original game, released for the Game Boy Advance in 2004. It's... very unique. It might be more correct to call it a reimagining than a remake. The atmosphere and art style is completely different from the rest of the series. Although it follows the same basic plot, the characters have been replaced by new ones. It also has an entirely new soundtrack, and reuses a lot of mechanics from the remake of Medorot 2, commonly known outside Japan as Medabots. This wasn't exactly well received by fans, who hated the art style and felt that the changes made by the developers were rejecting the history of the series. It probably was a financial failure, because the series would then be dormant for six years until the release of Medorot DS, which returned to the old style. It's 2017 now, and the series has reached its 20th anniversary. On the 28th of November, it will have been 20 years since the original Game Boy title was released. On the 21st of December, Medorot Classics will be coming to the 3DS. It compiles the first five mainline games of the series into one package, with a couple of new features such as wireless functionality and being able to save and load the game at any time. So, happy birthday!